right, boys and girls. While we let that uh, chassis dry, uh, I'm going to go ahead and clean up this, this push button. I have already washed it with soap and water in the bathroom sink, so it's pretty clean dirt-wise. Now I need to get some corrosion off of these, these little sliding contacts. You can see how they work. These contacts slide. The push buttons are already working better since I cleaned all the grime out of them. So sometimes they grab, sometimes they don't. I'm not sure what happens that makes them not grab. Maybe this one here, there we go. So, so this one here was stuck in and it keeps the little, the little engaging bar um, moved out of the way so they won't grab. See, there we go. So this one here is not returning. Let's see. And that won't, uh, it needs to, there we go. See, it needs to come back. I will lubricate all that after I'm done cleaning. But for right now, I'm, the first thing I'm going to do is clean these little sliding contacts with some, um, some lacquer thinner, and then I'll use some deoxid. Before I go at it with deoxid, I usually clean some of the grime off of the contacts with lacquer thinner. That way, uh, the deoxid can go right to work. That includes cleaning all the, the flux off of the little terminals. Uh, so this kind, this is where that contact broke off. So this one will never work again. There's nothing I can do about that. And there are sliding contacts on both sides. So there's some over here too. It doesn't all come off with the lacquer thinner, but if there's oil and grime and stuff on there, that will attract dirt. And yeah, the deoxid will kind of get it out of the way for the time being, but you don't want it there attracting dirt. So this will dissolve away that and take it away. It doesn't do anything about any, any corrosion on the copper, but it, but it does take away all the other stuff. So it's doing a pretty good job of cleaning that up. Before I use the deoxid, I'm going to go ahead and remove solder from the places that uh, uh, where I have had wires connected that I want to I want to reconnect. So I'm going to go ahead and remove solder from these three places here and from this ground connection. I'm going to leave these wires to the power switch connected here, and I'll just strip them back and we'll do it. Uh, we'll just splice them together with the the new wire. Okay, so eight goes under here. I'll probably, I'll probably solder a wire to that, and then I'll join the two wires together in the chassis. So I'll probably put a wire about, about four inches long on that. That way I can mount this thing, not worry about the wiring, and then go ahead and wire it up, put some shrink tubing over it when I'm done. And uh, and that, that becomes uh, a much easier job of putting this thing back in. I forgot to, oh. I did not realize this power switch had a gaping hole in the bottom of it. With a big gaping hole in the middle of it, that makes me worry. So I don't know if this thing was arcing and got hot or what. It looks like maybe it, it got pretty toasty. So let me strip back this wire and then I'll just, I'll just test it real quick. Because uh, that could be a problem. I'll have to put some other kind of switch in there. Probably one in the line cord if uh, I can't get this thing working. That's not good. Hmm. Well, let me try this real quick. I can't lose anything. I'll shoot a little deoxid in that little hole, but I got a feeling this switch is toast. And uh, this, this switch will be made of unobtainium. I'll never be able to find this switch.
Sometimes it makes contact, but not very often. Hmm. It's got to be absolutely reliable before I'll be comfortable with it, but it might be that I can make it that way. It was pretty dirty down there, and that dirt was right there on the shaft that goes down into the switch. So I might get lucky here. I hate these cans that the Oxit uses. I hate them. The can has to be totally upright for it to work. I hate that. If I can ever find it, an alternative, I will use it. Hey, it's getting better, guys. Check that out. I may have gotten lucky here. Because if that was just dirt and stuff down in there, then uh, that definitely makes things better. I wonder if I should rinse it out with some lacquer thinner now and then do this again. Oh yeah, there's some nastiness coming out of there. Look at that, that's some nasty stuff. A couple big globs of dirt have come out of this thing. I'm going to keep my eye on this. I'll keep testing this. But all this dirt came out of there. That may have been that may have been the issue. Let's just see. Time will tell. Time and testing. If it's unreliable, I'll put a line switch in. See that? The stu stupid can has to be completely upright for it to work. One of the keys to using deoxid is to work it after you sprayed it, and you can see the line forming where the deoxid is stripping away the oxides. Okay, next pair, kind of dry off any the excess that's just laying there not doing anything, makes it a little less messy, but leave the deoxid on the contacts that you're trying to help out. And the truth is I think these are, the, this particular kind is not really set up for a lot of lubrication. This is fiber here. Lubrication is only going to gum that up. It's an interesting material. I hadn't noticed that before. It's kind of like phenolic, but it's it's a little different. It's got a grain to it. But the grain is kind of going that way. These are actually working okay. Down inside here, there is a sliding bar back and forth it goes. See if you can see it. I don't I doubt you can see it. There's a little triangle bar with triangles on it. They're actually little cams. Those little cams they fit loosely enough that I don't think they need lubrication. 
I might put just a tiniest, tiniest bit of grease on the place where this, this, this plate slides in and out. It pushes against this cam and operates a crossbar that unlocks it so this, the, the button you're pushing can lock in place. Maybe a touch of sewing machine grease on each one of those, but I think that's about all I can do. And maybe I can lubricate right there where it slides in and out on that side. There's a spring on this side, and maybe I can lubricate where that bar slides in and out. But that's all. It, it's it's going to make minimal difference, but if it makes any difference, that's good. Okay, grab my favorite lubricant. You've been watching my videos. You know I like this stuff. Let me get this towel out of here. It's screwing up the light. Just a touch down here where this comes out of this sliding, out of this opening. So the little triangle cam pops out of a long slot on each bar that you push in. And when you push it in, you push it in far enough and that cam catches in a small slot. So right here is the small slot, right there. And if you watch, you see the, now you see how it's caught in this longer slot right here? And when you push this button in, the button, the, the bar between the two slots catches on that cam and pushes it out of the way to unlock it, to unlock the next the one that is locked. And then as you push further down, it locks into the small opening in this, this, lap, this push button shaft. Okay, this is really hard to show. Okay, so there is the small slot. Now watch the button. See how it comes up and then it locks this one here locked in the small slot. When I push this button back in, it pushes that cam out of the way and then locks it into the small slot. My camera battery died, so let me explain to you what I'm doing here. Um, I am just taking a little touch of grease and the little tip of that cam where it pokes through those slots, those two slots I was pointing out, the, the short one and the long one, well that cam pokes through those slots and it locks the uh, shaft in place against that crossbar. If you put a little bit of lubricant right on the tip there, it'll slip into place more readily and lock better. It'll, and it'll pop out of place more easily when you go to unlock it. So that, uh, that's really about all you can do lubrication wise, but it does make this work a lot smoother. Okay, let me uh, spray these once again with the oxid and I'll operate them all and then I'll be pretty well ready to install this thing. See, if I tilt it even that much, it doesn't spray. It's so frustrating. And what will happen is it'll run out of propellant because of that. And then I, then I have deoxid left in the can that I can't use. for me to set this aside and leave it alone now. I told you I was going to try to make the, the uh, push buttons work and that these coils were uh, the, the biggest problem with that because three of these coils have leads that were broken off and one of them has a lead that looks like it was broken off short was broken short or maybe clipped short not sure so the first things first I want to test each one of these and make sure they're all they all have continuity so let's uh, set up the ohm meter here. I just need to con connect to one spot for the ground because the ground runs like a little bus all the way across all of them. I guess it just goes right to the frame. That's good enough. Okay, 2.6 ohms on that first one. 2.6 ohms on that one. 3.1 ohms there. 3.1 ohms there, 3.2 ohms, so that coil is good even though the wire is short. This last coil, 3.0 ohms, it's good too even though the wire is short. This one's going to be the tricky one, let's just see. Oh. 
3.2 ohms. So all of them have good coil continuity. There's nothing worse than getting into a radio and discovering that these little screws don't turn. First thing, make sure I brush off. See, look at that dust. Make sure I brush that dust off of there. You should do this if you if you want to clean your the threads. Believe me, you'll be cussing yourself when you're putting the radio together if you haven't cleaned these threads and put a little lubricant on them. Because then they're hard to turn, you get one that's stuck, and not, if you want it to work, you got to take it back out. And uh, that's not always convenient. Since they often get little tight spots in them, I'll put the smallest amount of grease on each of the threads. Just, it, I mean, we're talking a very small amount. Okay. Put a little on each one. All right, so now I've got some grease on each one. I'm going to turn each one just to kind of work that grease. And also what that does is that moves that slug in there. And if there's a lot of dust or anything like that, it'll kind of work some of that out and make it easier to turn after this. 14. See, there. Now this, this one turns very easily. I've got grease on the threads, just a very fine layer. Not really enough to attract a lot of dust. I'm not going to worry about where the heck it was, how many turns. Because I'm going to have to find stations anyway. I don't, there's no point worrying about that. So the thing to do here, work this out till you get to some clean threads. Don't work it out too far. You don't want to mess up that slug in there. It's really easy, believe me. I have messed them up, I know. See how easy that turns? That's just slick as snot, man. What it's doing when you're doing this is there's a, it's called sintered iron, I believe, an iron core, like a slug, a little piston that is driving in and out of this cylinder as you do this. And it changes the resonant frequency of the tank circuit by changing the inductance of this coil. One, now you get, I think the way it works is you get with, you get kind of in range of the station by adjusting these. You use those trimmer caps to kind of maximize, to peak them. I think that's how it works. I've done this before. It was a Fairbanks Morse that I did this on fairly recently. It's kind of a nice design. The Zenith one just uses a, uh, um, a slug coil with no trimmer caps. And uh, I think this design probably gets you better results. Certainly gives you another sort of um, axis of adjustment, if you will. This reminds me when I worked on cars, I used to use a lot of anti-seize. I never put really anything together without using anti-seize. You know, I, I used to build a lot of air-cooled engines, VWs, Porsches, and um, a little BMW that was air-cooled. The exhaust manifolds on those get particularly hot. That's the hot spot in any engine is the, right where the exhaust manifold meets the head. The thing is, on a water-cooled car, you can just increase the water, the cooling jacket around that spot. But an air-cooled car, you can do things to kind of improve airflow and improve conduction, but still it's the hottest part of the car, you know, the engine. Um, well, whenever you have fasteners that get really, really hot like that, they tend to want to uh, gall together, you know, and they kind of corrode and they they sort of meld together. Not quite a like a weld, but they, they gall together so that you know, all the expansion and contraction causes them to kind of, on the surface of the threads, for the material to kind of roll some and kind of become part of each other. Well, if you use anti-seize, it allows the, the expansion and contraction without all the galling, and it enables you to take it apart when you need to. And so I got in the habit of using that on, on Volkswagen engines especially, because they get really hot. I, was, I never, ever had a problem with taking an engine apart that I had put together. You know, on Volkswagens, or on German cars, you don't have wheel studs and nuts. What you have are bolts that you lug bolts. So you kind of have to hold the wheel up to the car 
and then get the bolts in the hole and thread them in that way. And it's a real pain because you're always sitting on the floor cradling the wheel between your knees and lifting it up in place and bolting it on. Well, I used to put anti-seize on those bolts and I never had one break or never had one get stuck, no, nothing, never stripped one. This is kind of like doing anti-seize. These things will never, it'll be decades before these things ever get tight, if they ever do. But they'll always turn right. They'll always turn correctly. They won't be, it won't, it doesn't make them loose or want to come apart. It just makes them work better. So I have this stuff here that I bought at Realco a while back. It's 22 gauge, solid core wire. It's tinned wire. It's nice wire for this. So on this one, where the hole where that comes out, I'll just stick it in there and put some solder on that and hopefully that'll work. But first I need to clean that up. There might be some wax or whatever there. Let me clean that up the best I can. And I'll stick it in far enough so that I can come out through this side and make contact with the wire on there too. Well, that's pretty easy to get through the hole. Looky there, guys. Now, what I'm going to do is bend this wire, and then I'll put a drop of solder on it right there. There, that'll kind of keep it from wanting to flex so much. Now, before I solder that puppy on there, let me see if it has continuity through that coil. Sure enough, okay. Before I solder this, let me show you what I did. If you look at that, that coil right there, you see the hole that that little uh, wire is coming out of? What I did was I took this 22 gauge signal wire and I passed it through that hole. And then I came around here and I wrapped it as tightly as I could around that, uh, that flexible wire. And so in doing so, then I was able to make good contact with it. Now this is going to be stiff and it might break off there if I flex it too much. Looking down inside there, you can see that slug. All right, and... See how it turns when I turn the screw? Watch it back out. See it backing out? I know this is crappy camera work, guys, but uh, there you can see how it works. Now I'll put it back, sort of where it was. Pretty neat, huh? I think that's cool. All right, let me get to soldering that, and uh, we'll get a look at it when we're all done with it. I want to run this signal wire through there, this solid core signal wire. Grab a hold of it from inside the form, and then kind of pull it out. There we go. Now, I'm going to bend this back. Take this wire and twist it around that little stub. It's not easy to do. You kind of get in here and you turn it like so. Yikes, this coil form has a crack in it. I didn't see that before. 
I didn't cause it because this brittle material I would have heard it cracking so I'll need to be especially careful I'll glue that when I'm all done you just twist that around there best you can and you get on get a hold of it and you crimp it once you get it kind of twisted around enough you'll be able to crimp it in place you kind of pull that wire stub that wire stub through just to be sure and then you get there like I've done here and you squeeze it down on there alright and then last thing and I have to be careful on this one because it's cracked you kind of squeeze these together that will stabilize it while you solder it the soldering part is hard because that little bit of wire does not like to take the solder and it requires kind of a high temperature to do it so I have to do it fast I don't like that that form is cracked I'm gonna have to be really gentle with it and it won't serve too well as a uh, strain relief if I don't glue it. Let's uh, just heat this up. That's, wow. What happens, that, co that co former doesn't, that coil form does not like heat. This one's going to be iffy. The other ones went a lot nicer than this one, but with that cracked former, it wants to, that cracked form, it wants to pull away. So I really didn't get sot a good joint on there, but maybe good enough for what I'm doing here. So all I can do is measure it and see. Okay, here goes. Well, check it out, man. So, if I'm real careful with this and I fix that coil form before I mess with it too much, I should be able to use that coil. But I'll have a spare because of the broken terminal on the push button that I can use just in case. So I will leave these lead lengths nice and long until I'm ready to put it all together. Last thing, I put a little touch of this glue on there. Okay. Now, here's something interesting, guys. This glue, when you get down toward the bottom of the bottle like that, it likes to get kind of hard and it doesn't like to work very well. So what I do, it works really well for me, is I mix a little lacquer thinner in it and stir it up real nice with a screwdriver, and it does pretty well. It, it thins it out, and the lacquer thinner does not hurt how the glue works. Lacquer thinner will dry out of there perfectly when uh, when it as it's drying now you be real careful not to get glue too far up into the former this one's cracked so I want to kind of put a little extra on there but normally I wouldn't put that much on the outside but what you got to try and do is be careful not to get it on the inside uh, not too far on the inside because you don't want that slug to get messed up in all that glue so real sparing. Now on the outside, I'm not too concerned about being sparing. I'm going to go ahead and kind of glob that on there a little bit because I want to see if I can't strengthen that form a little bit. And that will be about the best I can do on this. Now what I'm going to do is walk away from this for a good half hour and leave it be. And uh, that way it will have a chance to set up before I do anything else. Well, I, I'm getting this... Uh, this uh, station preset uh, lineup of uh, trimmer caps ready. Really there wasn't much to do except clean the thing off and uh, replace the wires because these wires even though they look cool they're getting kind of crunchy. See you can kind of see it they don't want to they're not they're stranded wire and they're not real flexible it's real crunchy inside that black uh, insulation that exists underneath this cloth. And I need to be able to bend these wires when I'm setting this thing up. So I just put some new wire on, no big deal. So this thing is ready to go. Next, I want to get this dial ready to go. I'm going to heed the advice of one of my uh, YouTube subscribers, Rebel9668. And he said, you better do something about that paint real quick before it all flakes off. And I, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with him. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to at least take a little bit of lacquer and go all the way around the edge. I'll test it in one little corner and make sure it doesn't dissolve what's there. And go all the way around the edge and kind of make this stuff so it doesn't want to peel off. 
And there's really not much I can do to clean this because as soon as I try, I'm going to start taking that paint off. So I'm just going to brush it gently with a brush and call it good. Now this, on the other hand, I will clean. Let me test it in one little inconspicuous area down here. See if I can get that to stay. Okay, it doesn't seem to be dissolving it, so I'm going to go ahead and go all the way around this thing because this stuff will come off and make a mess. All I'm going to do is go around the edge. Now, I believe that this is something you can get from radio days, but I'm not sure if this model is something they have. So, I'm, I'm going to pretend like this is totally unavailable, and uh, I'm going to treat it that way. And then if we have to go looking for one, we will, but I don't think we will. We just are real careful here. It doesn't seem to be hurting this, this paint that's already on there. I'm not sure what kind of paint this is. I didn't say this was ideal. This is just one approach, I think, to trying to prevent this stuff from peeling up. This stuff will sheet off like crazy. Just ask, just ask Gary. He went through it. This stuff is wanting to curl up and sheet off so bad that I have to do something to, to strengthen and make it more rigid. Otherwise, it will continue and it will peel right off of this radio. I have several Philco's with blank dials <laughs> and uh, I really don't want this radio to turn out this way. I put a lot of work into it even though it's not my radio I still want it to last. I noticed something just the other day when I was looking at this radio it's missing the dial pointer altogether. I looked at my first videos of this and there is no dial pointer so I'm gonna have to scare something up and I don't know what I'm gonna use yet. Okay, I'm going to set this little puppy aside and let it dry. Okay, I'm just going to wipe this thing off. Um, all I'm doing is this got a little water on it. And I'm just going to start at this end and see how it works. Yep, takes it right off. I think this thing will be totally safe to wash in the sink. I'll be right back. All right. I was not able to wash this spot out. I don't know what that is. So it's going to have to stay there. Check out how much this stuff yellowed. The, the yellow areas are the part that were sort of in the sunlight when this thing was sitting in the radio because that dial shades the rest of it. And this is more or less a light diffuser. It's about as clean as I'm going to be able to get it. But really the only parts you're going to see are right here where these orange lines are. So there's a little bit of area here that will be affected. But we can live with that I think. You know the alternative would be to try to make a new piece of plastic like this. The, the trouble is it's glossy on this side or semi-glossy. And real matte with a texture on this side here. And I don't have any material like that. Let me just see how this goes. And and uh, and, and if it doesn't work out, well, I can always replace it. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, just do a real quick job. Just show you as I go. That's all. I'm not going to do a lot of explaining. I'll just, uh, just let you know what I'm doing. So first I'm going to put a little bit of... Uh, of uh, sewing machine grease. I've already cleaned out those ball bearings with some lacquer thinner. So I'll put some sewing machine grease on the balls. You kind of want to get around as, as many of them as you can get to. Just kind of get over in here. So once I put that on there, I want to work this cap back and forth. And you'll start to feel the difference. It only takes a, a few times and you'll start to feel it. This one's pretty, actually pretty tight. And these ones that are open from this side, I'll usually pack a little bit of grease down in there too. And I just use the old uh, wheel bearing method of get the grease 
in the vicinity and then just shove it down in as much as you can with your fingertip. And you'll get some of it there. A lot of it you won't, but you'll get enough there that it'll make it worth your effort. And then you just wipe off the excess, just like you would with a wheel bearing. Once you get the grease where you want it to be, well then you just take the excess and, and wipe it off. So you just kind of do this. You'll be surprised by how much of it goes down in that little gap. I want to take a little bit of oil and get it down in that bushing right in there. It's a little bit like a, it might be like a little needle bearing or something. I, I'm not sure, but it feels more like just a, a bushing to me. It's on every single one of these. And a lot of times that is the place where that's one of the sources of, of tightness when you're trying to turn it. It's real hard sometimes to get the oil right to the spot, so you have to use a little excess. Yep. So you put that on there and it's just loosened right up. I don't know why that is the area that is always causing the problems with tightness. I was watching a Shango 66 video. I don't know if you guys have ever seen Shango. He's got kind of a different style, but he knows a lot of stuff. He's a smart guy. Anyway, he was going through a what he called a TV graveyard. Um, one of those places out in the desert, like an abandoned town, where they just threw all their stuff in a dump. I don't quite get that. That's something that happens out here that is not, is not really part of my experience, so I don't understand it, but it's something that they do. Anyway, he found, a, he found an old RCA TV that uh, was from the late 70s, it looked like. And uh, unbelievably, the thing kind of worked. And then I'm watching the resurrection video now where he's actually going to make it work, uh, make it light up and work. So pretty cool. So put a little deoxid on these fingers. Okay, these, this bugger is ready to go back on the radio also. So I think all of the pieces, this was the last of the pieces, all the pieces are ready to go back on. This thing is ready. Well, once again, this video has gone long, so I'm going to close it down now, and uh, we'll pick it back up here in a day or two. So for now, from your western outpost in Salt Lake City, it's Friday, July the 28th. It's a nice hot day outside. And this is Michael, and that's all for now.